Hi friends, let's talk about the knee sports injury. The knee injuries usually occur on rotation on a flex knee and the injured structures are usually ACL, medial collateral ligament and medial meniscus. Now an MRI is a very important tool and we can clearly see here that this is the anterior cruciate ligament and this is something that prevents the anterior translation of tibia onto the femur and restricts the hyperextension and internal rotation. Whereas the posterior cruciate ligament, the most posterior structure on the upper end of tibia, restricts the external rotation. Now, when you have a tear of the medial meniscus, sometimes it buckles up at the posterior margin and it looks like there are two PCL, called as a double PCL sign, an important MRI investigation. As a student, sometimes on an x-ray, they can ask you, showing you the tibial spine or the intercondylar area. On the upper end of tibia, what are the structures that go from anterior to posterior? So it's a good idea to remember it's the anterior horn of medial meniscus number one, behind that ACL, then the anterior horn of lateral meniscus, going posterior, posterior horn of lateral meniscus, posterior horn of medial meniscus, and as I just told you, the most posterior element is the posterior cruciate ligament. When we look at the neuromuscular disorders, the disc prolapse is one of the important things that you should remember. Radiating with back pain going to one of the limbs called a sciatica, so you can see the vertebra here, the disc, the grayish area, vertebra, then the disc, the grayish area, vertebra, and the disc, the blackish area, which is prolapsed out, compressing the lower nerve roots. When we look at the oblique or the lateral view of the spine, you see a dog. This dog is called the Scotty dog. The superior articular process is the, the ear of the dog. The inferior articular process is the front leg of the dog. And then the neck of the dog is made by an area called as interarticularis. Whenever I jump, I turn, I take a twist, all the force in my body, they go towards the neck of the dog and it's the weak link. And this is the area from where the vertebra will break. Vertebra is called a spondylo. Break is called as lysis. Combo is called as spondylolysis. Break in the neck of the dog or dog with a collar in the neck is a phrase to be used for spondylolysis, which is most commonly occurring at the L5 level and then followed by the slip of one vertebra over the other called a spondylolisthesis which occurs between the L5 and S1 vertebra which is very very important. So spondylolysis is break in the interarticularis, listhesis, slip of the vertebra over the other. As the slip goes ahead, one vertebra will come over the other and it will look like as if this hat which Napoleon Bonaparte used to wear, right, it has been inverted causing it called as an inverted Napoleon hat sign, which is seen in the end stages of spondylolisthesis on the AP view. This is extremely important. And if they have this x-ray, they will be asking you for sure in the final exams. Coming to a lesion which will occur, if you're trying to catch a ball when you're playing cricket, and if the ball strikes your thumb and takes it into radial deviation, at the metacarpopharyngeal joint, there can be a destruction of the ulnar collateral ligament, which can be seen on an x-ray as a small point here, called as the gamekeepers of the skier's thumb, a very, very important point. And it is the phalangeal area, which is more commonly damaged than the metacarpal area. Similarly, the prominent calcaneal tuberosity with overlying bursitis is called as Haglund's deformity, which is seen on the posterior aspect of the calcaneum. When you are involved in a sports injury, you can have a mallet finger, which is avulsion of extensor tendon with a distal phalanx from the distal phalanx. And this can be bony, soft tissue or both. So mallet finger is important and the usually treatment is conservative with a mallet splint for six to eight weeks. This is a question again coming up. Its counterpart is operative. It's avulsion of the flexor deuterum profundus from the distal phalanx. It's a zone one injury of the finger and the usual treatment is operative. And now you can be given an x-ray showing the lateral deviation of the great toe called as hallux valgus. And this is how it can be. It can be bilateral hallux valgus. You should keep in mind this is something which is very common and very commonly asked. Destruction of the cartilage with the underlying bone is osteochondritis. And they can just show you osteochondritis of different body parts. And the death of the bone due to poor blood supply is called as avascular necrosis. So one of the common areas where you can see osteochondritis is the lateral surface of the medial femoral condyle called as osteochondritis desiccans. 
and you treat that by doing the micro drilling or micro fracture techniques or you can have an osteochondritis involving the lunate which is called the Kahnbach disease and lunate has an N center and the, so does Kahnbach has an N center and that's how you combine them and then you can have a osteochondritis of a navicular which is called as a collar, lur, lur, both end the same. So you can remember them like this. And then you will have osteochondritis of the vertebral bodies called as Sherman's disease, which is the peripheral part. And if you have the central part called as a calves disease, they are all osteochondritis. This is a osteochondritis occurring in the adolescent age group. Coming to the avascular necrosis, you need to remember AVN of important areas like the femoral head, the proximal pole of scaphoid, the lunate, the capitulum, the body of talus, or the head of humerus. Rarely distal femoral condyles. So these are the seven areas where you see it. And remember, the dead bone is always white. The dead bone is always white. So it is the dead bone which is white because the vascularity is not there to cause osteopenia. So that's how the dead bone looks white. Similarly, the blood supply, the scaphoid goes from distal to proximal. And when there's a fracture involving, it is the proximal pole which is known to undergo a vascular necrosis. And that's how the white. So dead bone is white. Remember the rule. So dead bone is white, that's the rule. And then this is again the head of humerus where it looks white. And this is called as a snow cap sign, which you should remember. This x-ray, if it's in the department, will be given to you, humeral head AVN. The anterolateral aspect of the head is involved of the femur in the avascular necrosis, giving a crescentric lucency over the head along with the whitish area surrounding it, called as a crescent sign. There will be two thick bands called as a double line sign on MRI and then the treatment is making holes inside the bone called as core decompression or you can make a hole and fix with a muscle called as pedicle graft or you can do a hip replacement which is the number one treatment for this condition in today's world. Coming to the last section for today, the pediatric orthopedics and you should remember that if there's something wrong in the head of femur or the acetabulum or the hip joint, two movements which are limited are internal rotation and abduction. So this movement in which the examiner takes the leg out, takes the hip in, interrotation and the abduction. These are two movements which are sensitive of indicating that there is something wrong in the joint. And if you have small femoral head and you have the shallow acetabulum, this is called as, this is called as small femoral head and shallow acetabulum. This is called as developmental dysplasia of hip. There is a suprolateral displacement of the head. That's how it goes. The Shenton's arch, which is the pubic rami, the head and the neck of femur, is broken. The femoral artery, which travels along the head, called as vascular sign of Narath. Here, the femoral artery travels, but there is no ground level resistance, so the artery pulsations cannot be felt. The size of the epiphysis is smaller. The astablum is shallow, unlike the properly curved astablum of the normal side. So shallow astablum, small epiphysis, broken Shenton's arch, vascular sign of Narat positive, suprolateral displacement are the features of DDH. But right at the core of DDH is the shallow astablum that one should remember. And when I look at the classical test for DDH, if you abduct the thighs, the head goes in. This is called as the Ortolani maneuvers. Ortolani Hip ko andar lana means trying to reduce the hip inside. Very, very important. You will hear a click and the head comes in. Whereas bahar low or the bar low test is dislocating. You add up and it goes out. Tuck. This is called as the bar low's maneuver. And once it goes out, you will do an autolani maneuver to reduce it back. And similarly, you have an alley's test where when you flex the knee and the hip, the side which is dislocated is lower down. And then you have the Kleisic test for bilateral DDH, which is important. 